Previously, I've learned hidden inside our smartphones is a magical ingredient, rare earths. I'm told that my iPhone has rare earths in the screen, which makes it light up, in the speakers where I hear my tunes. Rare earths are critical metals every nation wants, but the supply of which only one commands. The critical point is who controls the processing technologies. No other country can compete with China. But beyond the latest gadgets, I discovered massive amounts of rare earths are used in powerful magnets, crucial in the world's shift to low-carbon energy. A windmill or your electric vehicle, we will not transition without a really good supply of rare earths. Now, in part two of the power scramble, China used rare earths as a weapon. I find out why some countries are forced to look beyond China as well as how and where they do so. Malaysia is breaking this dominance of red earths by China. And to my surprise, even China is looking past its own borders for this precious resource. These illegal red earths are going to China. I witness the fallout from this global scramble. It has severe consequences, cancers and brain tumors. So they're going to escort us out, OK? They leave now. As a musician living in Sydney, I love the ethnic mix. A taste of everything from all corners of the world. And friends, too. Louis, my man, how are you going? Good, thank you. Good to see you. Thanks you for too. coming. Thanks so much, guys. Fellow musician right here. He plays the guitar, sings what else? Yeah, a bit of drum, a bit of every, everything. Yeah. A bit of everything, right? Yeah. Louis like nearly everyone in this room, belongs to the Myanmar diaspora. Today's event is part of a fundraiser, which hopes to see democracy return to Myanmar. Our heart goes out to the people of Myanmar fighting for democracy, human rights, and we will hold a candlelight vigil to pay tribute to their bravery and sacrifice. Amid the pro-democracy posters, I spot these. Stop illegal rare earth mining. Your smartphone is killing Kachin. Lewis, I was seeing these signs saying stop illegal rare earth mining and I didn't realize that there was a Myanmar connection to rare earths. Yeah, Myanmar is the uh, fourth largest um, exporter uh, that rare earth. Because of the politics situations, hard to know, hard to help, could be higher. Are you referring to the military coup? Yeah, because of the military coup. In February 2021, military overthrown the civilian governments. Uh, since then, we know that they increased a lot of the illegal mining. It's hard to tell the, the, the real data. Where exactly is it happening? I mean, I'm guessing that it's happening here in Kachin. I saw the sign saying, save Kachin, stop illegal mining. Kachin is uh, northern Burma, which is the borderline with China. Kachin has uh, a lot of rare earth. Right, I remember reading a while ago there was something that happened at a music festival in Kachin. I mean, if you fight the jets, they bombed the music festival and they're killing more than 100 people. One thing clear is to get the weapon, they need a lot of big fun. And we know that illegal rare earth mining is one of the major source. This makes us really worried that all the illegal mining, that's money not only for the miner company, they also it's go to the junta, the military governments. That's how they get all the weapons and then, then back to killing us. But what do you mean by illegal mining? The miner company, they don't get permit. When they do illegally, they don't have to pay all the costs, legal costs, all the consultations, all the, the right procedure, so they can cut the cost. You're saying that the people that own these mines are giving kickbacks to operate. That's quite an allegation. There's a lot of activists around there now. They've been tracking and we know that that's illegal mining, this rare earth mining is one of the major source of funds. 
From my earlier visit to a project in Australia, I've learned a mine with environmental safeguards costs millions of dollars. Mining projects take so much time and money to get off the ground. But an illegal mine in Myanmar can be set up with barely $100,000, generating huge profits that more than cover bribes. Reports say these illegal mines are in areas controlled by the militia, linked to the junta or military. That's how Rare Earths allegedly fund a violent crackdown on civilians. Rare Earths are a group of 17 metals, and demand remains insatiable. They are inside our phones, iPads, laptops, and other electronics. They are used in green technology and defense equipment, and therefore seen as critical. China has the world's largest rare earth deposits. It dominates global supplies, followed by the US, Australia, and Myanmar. We do need to mine for rare earth metals, but I can't seem to shake off the fact that there could be a darker side to mining it. I really want to know more, so luckily Lewis has put me in touch with someone who can do just that. So I see we've got a Google Earth image here, but what exactly are we looking at? So as you know, the current political crisis in Myanmar is very difficult to put inside, especially we have a very sensitive question like this. I see some tiny blue-green dots. Can you just zoom in a little bit? Actually, these are the illegal rare earth mining area. So these blue spots are filled with the very toxic material. Right, I want to count how many there are. Can you just zoom out just a tiny bit? OK, so we've got one cluster here, two, three, a big one here four, and then five, and oh, six. And this is all happening in Kachin State, like Lewis was mentioning. Yeah, in Kachin State, close to the China border. So these pools, are they just like dug into the ground? Yes, so they dig the ground and then they line up with the plastic sheets, and then they put all these chemicals. If the plastic sheet tear, the chemical go inside the soil and then damage the environment. Our concern is the lack of the regulatory body and and lack of compliance on the environmental practice. I counted six operations, but how big is this problem? This kind of illegal practice is a boom after the uh, military coup happened. Some estimate that the size of this illegal mining area is equivalent to the size of Singapore. Singapore? Yeah. Once these rare earths are mined, where do they go? These are owned by Chinese business firms and local owners. Rare earths are going to China. And then, you know, because of the illegal practice, Myanmar rare earths are really cheap for China. China has the largest rare earth deposits anywhere on our planet. So why import from Myanmar? The answers may be found in this report. As China's rare earth industry boomed, there were worries about environmental damage, as well as dwindling deposits. From 2016, China intensified efforts to clean up and closed many toxic rare earth mines. That meant China needed new sources of raw materials. It turned to Myanmar's rich deposits. So how exactly do these illegal mines pose a health risk? Jonathan Lildeblad is a Myanmar native. He says, he knows the perfect way to help me understand. There's actually two forms of mining. There's one form where they strip the topsoil and dig up everything that's underneath. And then there's a second option, which is where they drill directly into the earth and try and pull everything out. So what you're seeing in Kachin State is the second option, which is drilling into the earth. Right, so in Myanmar, we're not digging in large areas, we're just drilling small holes. Exactly. So the challenge with rare earth mining is that the rare earths are bound tightly with the sediment. So the issue is finding a way to make it easier to get it out of the ground. So for that demonstration, what I have brought here is some bubble tea that represents the rare earths that are in the sediment. So here, the bubbles represent the rare earths that are bound into the ground, bound tightly with the soil. All right, so I can see all the bubbles are all fused together. So what we would do is that we would drill a hole in the ground, take some kind of liquid, so in this case, I'm using tea, pour it into the ground, and then take a pipe, and then pump it out. Ah, oh, right. Okay, so you pour the liquid in there, and that helps loosen up the bubble tea, which is the rare earth rocks. 
and then it makes it easier to get out of the ground. That's correct. We're using tea here, but what exactly is being used in Myanmar? They're using toxic materials, which include sulfuric acid. It's all meant to create chemical reactions to separate out the rare earths from the sediment. Sulfuric acid, that can't be good. I mean, back at school, we used to do experiments in chemistry and it just burned through things. Can you imagine the kinds of chemical reactions happening in the soil? It's extremely dangerous and extremely unhealthy. Right, okay, I get this. But when I saw the satellite images over Kachin, I saw these large pools of toxic waste that were bluish and greenish in color. Is that what you've prepared for me today? What I want to show you is that once they pump out from the ground, it has to go somewhere. So they put it into these pools, ordinarily lined with plastic to keep it separated out from the ground. So these are just plastic sheets. I mean, they could corrode over time, right? And that's exactly what happens. They can continue to corrode, and then the chemicals leach out into the soil, the groundwater. For purposes of demonstration, mm. I'm going to go ahead and poke a hole in the plastic, and now it's leaching out. Right. This toxic waste could seep into the soil and potentially the groundwater. That's really bad. It's incredibly harmful to human health. It has severe consequences that include cancers like bowel, kidney, and brain tumors. It also impacts the heart and also has been found to affect pregnancy and fertility. That's crazy. So if rare earth mining were done legally, we wouldn't see these type of problems? Correct. Compliance with the law would not cause this degree of problems. Rare earth metals help give our screens those brilliant colours. They are also behind the vibrate function in our phones. They are even in speakers and the mic. Hey Lewis, how are you going? Oh yep, I'll start up for a Zoom call. I'll be five minutes. Give me a sec. I really need to see what was happening up close, on the ground. I thought about travelling to Kachin, but given the political situation, it's just not possible. So I've reached out to a journalist who lives inside Myanmar, and he didn't want his identity revealed, so we're going to call him Nyang. Louis, thanks for helping us translate. Oh, my pleasure. Louis, can you tell Nyang to go into Kachin to help film these illegal mines? I really, really want to hear from the people that work at these mines. I don't know. So last night I sent an email to Jonathan. I basically said to Jonathan, who's a bubble tea slash rare earth expert, if rare earth mining was an issue in other parts of Southeast Asia. He suggested that I take a look at Malaysia. He sent me a few articles to check out. What really struck me is that the problems seem to have only surfaced quite recently in Malaysia. I mean, take a look at this date, it's just 24th May 2023. This other one is 25th May 2023. So I kind of understand what's happening with Myanmar, but what's the deal with Malaysia? The articles Jonathan sent me got me curious. So Malaysia, here I come. All right, so I'm just about to take off my flight to see the KL. First, time to get some rest. Prior to my trip, I've learned Malaysia's rare earth reserves are small, less than 1% of the world's deposits, but valued at 180 billion US dollars. We've just reached the city of Kuala Pillar. Now, I've reached out to Damien, who's been following the problem of legal mining closely here in Malaysia. He's asked me to meet him in a village about 20 minutes away from here. Palm oil plantations are everywhere in Kuala Pillar. They provide jobs and drive the economy. Quiet and sleepy, everything is serene. Hi Damien, nice to meet you. Hi Kathy. Yet, something sinister lurks. Kathy, this is the main entrance to the illegal site. 
you can see that it has been sealed off. I see the tape, but what does it say? In English, it basically means Land and Mining Authority. And then below here, it says that do not enter investigation in progress. All right, so obviously we can't go in, but I really want to take a peep inside. Okay, so it looks like there's a bunch of pipes and I know that's used to get rare earth out of the ground, right? That's right. In a legal uh, operation, they may have proper pipes, but uh, these pipes, the quality of the pipes are very questionable. We don't know whether these pipes are actually manufactured for such an operation. They are high risk of toxic acid that they need for the operation, leaking into the ground. Right, there's some cheap uh, the, They would not go for high quality products because this is a sort of a hit and run per, uh, operation. They come here, they extract as much as possible. The minute they get a sniff of uh, authority or they suspect that action will be taken, they are gone. Now, look at the size of the gate. It's so uh, wide. This actually shows the size of their operation and uh, this accommodates huge lorries, vehicles to go in and out. Now, didn't the villagers here from the Kampong notice these large vehicles going in and out? Yes, lorries going in and out even at night you know, have raised suspicion and the authorities investigated and found out that this is actually an illegal mine and uh, this is the entrance going through private land. Right, so is there more? This is the tip of the iceberg. There's a huge land where the operation really takes place. It extends right into the state land. Let's go. Beyond its main gate, the mine extends several kilometres inside. It's surrounded by palm oil plantations in this village of a few hundred people. So far, no illnesses have been reported. We drive along the perimeter of the site. I've seen where it starts. I want to see where it ends. But we are stopped. Local officials want us gone. So, Demi, can we go like even a little bit inside? No, uh, not, not allowed. allowed. Not allowed. Oh, okay. uh, you can ask them. They, they won't allow. How far in is the illegal mine? Um, kawasan yang diceroboh dan uh, di mana perlombongan haram itu dibuat berapa la, berapa jauh? Saya tak bagi tak boleh bagi maklumat selengkap mungkin. Ah, uh, he's saying that he cannot give the full uh, information. Tak, tak, tak boleh, kita tak uh. boleh buat soal dia. Tak payah, itu cukup lah. Cukup, cukup tak kan? Yang uh. yang tuan dah habis dalam kawasan ni. Ah, uh. uh, kemudian kita buat kita keluar. Kita dalam dalam. So they're gonna escort us out. Okay. They leave now. Okay. Damien, why did they stop us from filming? Well, it's a small town and something like this doesn't happen here. And this event actually brought damaging attention to Kuala Pila. Now, Damien, you mentioned that that is just the tip of the iceberg. What did you mean by that? Well, actually, the operation extends a few kilometres inside the forest. They have pipelines running. They have a huge pond where the flow of waste are stored. If you see, it is not a proper pond. You know, it may break or it could even uh, leak wastewater into the aquifers. Right, OK. That looks like what I learned about in Myanmar. Yes, uh, most probably uh, their modus operandi is basically the same. When we were there, we saw palm oil trees everywhere, just all around us. Isn't it dangerous to have this operation right next to a palm oil plantation? Definitely. There are high risk of toxic leaking into the ground. It is very, very poisonous. If it was let to continue, it would have definitely damaged the harvest. Palm oil is one of the biggest money earner for the government. It will all be destroyed. How common are these illegal rare earth mines in Malaysia? A handful of them have been busted. We don't know how many are still running that has uh, escaped detection by the authorities. OK, but who is behind all of this? It's not clear yet, but Chinese nationals have been arrested from uh, mine owners to uh, laborers. China has the largest uh, deposit known for rare earth material. However, it will not last forever. It's not China's fault because China is trying to save their own uh, rare earth elements for future use. In Malaysia, the laws are still being drafted for rare earth mining. There's a lot of new uh, guidelines to be created so that rare earth mining is safe. Many of these miners did not want to wait 
they just want to get rewards now. It was only last year Malaysia approved a rare earth mine, a pilot project in Perak State. Perak's deposits are pegged at 20 billion US dollars. Karthik, if you look at the pictures of the pilot project, we can observe how purpose built it is compared to the illegal mines. The pools built into proper cement base, an alarm system that will detect leaks, if any. This pilot project has many safety measures. Now, Damien, there has been a huge demand for rare earth mining in the world. Why has Malaysia not capitalised on this before? Karthik, it's not that simple. If Malaysia mines the huge reserve of rare earth material and leaves Malaysia unlivable, it will not be a good uh, decision. People of Malaysia have said no! People of Malaysia have said no! People don't like your taxi price! Karthik, these illegal mines are new to Malaysia. However, the issue of rare earth has been polarizing and worrying Malaysians for many, many years. Rare earth mining in Malaysia is new. Yet, it's light years ahead on another front. It turns out, for over a decade, Malaysia has been processing rare earths, turning them into this, oxides. Magical powders that make our gadgets super smart. You see, when first mined, rare earths are useless lumps of dirt. It's processing or refining that turns those rocks into valuable oxides. But there's a catch. This is Kuantan. This is the port city, just a three hour drive away from Malaysia's capital city of KL. Not far from the hustle and bustle of the city is this, Linus, a rare earth processing plant. Now this place is huge. It spans over 100 hectares, which is about the size of 150 football fields. The plant has been here more than 10 years. It has shaken up the global status quo, breaking a near monopoly held by companies in China. Linus is the only firm outside China that has successfully progressed to full production. Linus is now the largest processor of rare earths outside China. But in Malaysia, Linus is grabbing the spotlight for a different reason. We will fight to the end to make Malaysia safe. Stop Linus! Stop Linus! Linus, Linus, you're our case. We don't want your toxic waste. You see, rare earth processing produces low-level radioactive waste. So, from the start, environmental groups have wanted Linus gone. They accused the Australian miner of having no plans on how to permanently store its controversial waste. The fear, air, soil and water contamination. I'm at a fishing village where word got around of the river being at risk. Apa kabar Faisal? You coming out? You coming. You coming. Uh, oh, okay. I bought the wrong shoes for this. <laughs> All right, Faisal. So it looks like we're fishing for clams. Now, how do you do it? Senang saja. Okay, kita akan ini. Tarik, 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 tarik. Okay. Okay. I never thought my search for rare earths would involve hunting for clams, but here we are. Kadang-kadang pun kita menggunakan tangan pun ada. Let me try. Let me see if I can. Oh, I got one. Yeah. Ooh, look at this. Oh, senang, senang. So, how long have you been doing this for? Saya mencari kapal ini selama 30 tahun di Sungai Baluk. Dia tak ada apa racun ke apa ke. It's good. How far is your village from the Linus plant? Kilang Linus tak jauh. Dia mengambil masa selama 5 km sahaja. About 5 km? 5 km. Faisal insists a chat about Linus must happen with food for thought. 
quite literally. Oh, and with some of his friends. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. Okay, I'm a little hesitant to eat this, but. Mmm. Sedap. Sedap sekali. Ah. Mm. Ya, yeah, dia memang segar. Kepah ni segar. Tak ada racun ke, apa ke, toksik toksik ke, tak ada. Fine, well, I understand that you want me to taste this food because it is safe to eat because it was so close to the Linus plant. Is that right? Linus ni, orang cakap, bila adanya kilang Linus, seluruh penduduk-penduduk kampung Baluk akan bermasalah daripada kita dengar cukup takut sisa-sisa wangan daripada Linus boleh menyebabkan kalau lahirnya anak jadi cacat ke apa ke tak ada lagi isu tu belum ada ha, sampai ke sekarang ni lah. So it's been 10 years since Linus has been here now. Good or bad? Good, good. Yeah, man, Don't good. worry. Linus bagi peluang pekerjaan penduduk balut sekarang ni banyak anak nelayan pergi kerja Linus. Sebulan dua kali kita buat test air, sama ada air itu sesuai ke ataupun ada racun ke, ada toksik ke. Tapi apa yang kita dapat itu sebenarnya memuaskan, tidak melibatkan kerosakan meri-meri yang ada di sungai kita. I know I've asked you a lot of questions and we've barely eaten, so makan. Okay, Let's makan. Makan, makan, makan. Mm. Oh, terima kasih. Sedap. Mm. So all seems well for Linus, at least here at the fishing village. But not everyone agrees. I've met a group of fishermen who trust Linus in managing its radioactive waste. But I'm about to meet someone with a different take. Ah. Hi, Jia. Nice to meet you. Hello, Kartik. How are you? I'm good, I'm good. I mean, I'm glad I wore all the right thongs for this, but I still managed to get my pants wet on the way here. Awesome food, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Now, so it looks like we're planting mangroves. This behind us is what we just planted recently. It's about 4,000 seedlings. How long have you been doing this for? Yeah, I've been doing this uh, for quite a long time, more than 10 years, even before Linus uh, has opened up here in Kuantan. But since they have opened up, we felt that we have to do more. I know we're planting mangroves and they're good for the ecosystem, but what does that have to do with Linus? Well, um, what is it? how do I uh, put it? It does not have anything to do directly with Linus, mm. but mangroves are good as filters. It will add value. Linus being so nearby here, and with their accumulated radioactive waste at the back of their plant, we just don't know. We don't know what blows in the wind. So we feel it's good to plant mangrove. We hope that it will work as a filter and add quality to the life of the community here. So Jihan, I know you mentioned radioactive waste. Now I know it's only low levels of radioactive waste. I mean, we live with low levels of radiation all around us every day. So what's the problem? These waste are being dumped at the back of the Linus plant openly. Our concern is, even though it's low level of radioactive waste, the exposure over the time, it is now here 10 years. So there must be a side effect. That is our concern. There have been studies done by organisations such as the IAEA, an international body which looks into things like radiation safety. And they've said Linus has met all requirements. Yes, but what is worrying us is about their waste. It's just lying behind their plant and a permanent disposal facility is only being built now after 10 years, after a lot of protests from the local communities. OK, now hold up. What's a permanent disposal facility? Well, it's a structure where all the waste are not exposed to rain and other environmental elements and it keeps the waste uh, contained uh, so that no radiation escapes it. But you just said that the permanent disposal facility is being built, so what's the problem? Of course there is a problem, Kartik, because it's after 10 years. There has already been exposure for more than 10 years for the people around the community. 
Jihan, we haven't had any evidence of people falling sick. So where is your fear coming from? The fear stems from what happened in Bukit Merah in the late 80s and 90s, where a lot of people died from radiation. So we don't want a repeat of what happened there in Bukit Merah to happen here in Kuantan. Bukit Merah is a six-hour drive from Kuantan. In 1994, a rare earth processing plant run by Japan's Mitsubishi Chemicals was shut down. It was blamed for birth defects and leukemia cases. The plant had no long-term waste facility. Radioactive material was stored in rusted drums. It caused radiation leaks contaminating the area. It took several years to clean up. A permanent facility to seal off the waste was only built decades later in 2014. This site almost reminds me of a giant tomb, to be honest. The torn down factory and its toxic waste lie buried here. I can see how an ugly incident like this is something that some people just can't shake off that easily. Linus says comparisons to Bukit Merah are unscientific. To show there's nothing to hide, Linus granted a Malaysian news blogging site access to the plant in 2018. The question is, how safe is this entire thing? Well, for starters, I can literally and safely hold this with my bare hands. About the only similarity between Bukit Mira and Linus is that we both uh, have rare earths in the description of our business. Bukit Mira residue had 50 times the radioactivity that Linus has. Linus said studies proved his residue, rich in phosphate, could actually be used in fertilizers. But Malaysian authorities were not sold. In 2019, the Mahathir government ordered Linus to build a permanent disposal facility. Just as Linus was building the facility, the Anwar government took office. It issued an ultimatum. A complete ban on producing any radioactive waste by 2024, or the miner's license would be revoked. But in a sudden U-turn, it's now allowed Linus to continue with business as usual for much longer. However, there are conditions attached. So what now for Linus? I've come to the University of Malaya for answers. Collins, how are you going? Hi, Karthi, how are you doing? Good, thanks. For years, Collins Chong has been studying Malaysia's strategic stake in rare earth metals. Collins, can you tell me more broadly about how Linus operations work there? Yeah, sure. Let me show you, pardon my drawing, but <laughs> basically, this is uh, roughly the map of Australia. Okay, well, I'm glad you're doing it because it's way better than me. <laughs> So um, this is Mount Well. We host the uh, one of the best red earth materials in the world. This is Australia. Let me just show you roughly Peninsula Malaysia. So this is um, Kuantan, where Linus processing plant, the red earth material that is mined here in Mount Well, will then be transported to the port here, which will then be channeled all the way to this Kuantan plant. But Collins, I mean, why Malaysia? Why go to all the hassle? I mean, Australia has so much space. This is one of the primary reasons. Uh, okay, money, but how do you mean? Well, it's more cost-effective to be done in Malaysia. Labour costs are lower, manufacturing costs are lower. It always makes uh, you know, better economic science to be done in a place where it is cheaper and the returns will be greater. Okay, so the only reason you do that is because it's cost-effective? That's one of the reasons, of course, but also the geographical advantage of Malaysia. The eventual final product will then be exported to critical markets all over the world, including North America, in Europe and Japan. Okay, I can see how it all comes together. So Linus mines the rare earths here in Australia and then processes it in Kuantan and then exports it to the rest of the world. But why do we need Linus if China can do it at a competitive price? Well, Karthik, let me just show you by uh, having one more drawing. Karthik, to answer your question, look at this. 
Okay, it says rare earth prices and it looks like it's spiked quite a lot here. It skyrocketed back in 2010 as you can see. But why did this happen? Well, let me do another drawing. So Kartik, this is China. This is uh, Japan. These are the uh, disputed islands claimed by both countries. Right, is it the Senkaku Islands? That's what Japan call it, Senkaku. And China call it Tiayutai. This incident happened in 2010, where this was the Chinese fishing boat. <coughs> Japan detained the Chinese fishermen in these disputed uh, waters. And that incident caused a huge contentious uproar between both countries, and China used rattles as a weapon uh, in this regard. What do you mean by a weapon? Well, China halted the export of rattles to Japan. It shows that this can be used as a convenient strategic tool by China to serve its national interests. And uh, you know, this shows the need for countries to ensure that they are not beholden to certain countries. Right, so because China has the biggest rare earth supply, when they curb exports, the prices just go skyrocketing. Skyrocketed exponential spike. So this has profound implications on you know, the whole world, especially in economic terms and geopolitical purposes. The dispute was somehow uh, cool when China eventually resumed the exports and then prices going back down to the normal range. So how does Linus fit into the big picture in all of this? Japan has uh, you know, invested heavily on Linus. Learning its lessons from this incident in 2010, Japan has funded a lot of different investments on Linus to ensure that long-term resilient supply chain of red oils, breaking this whole near total dominance of red oils by China. Ah, uh, right, okay, I see the Japan connection. So basically, they don't want to be in the same position again. Right, so this serves as a critical lesson not only to Japan, but to other countries. Stop, Linus! So I have a question about Book and Mirror. People are worried about history repeating itself in Kuantan. So the fields are irrational. As far as Bukimira is concerned, this is an entirely different setting. And Linus has proven itself to be strictly adhering to all the revolutions in place. Despite that track record, Linus now faces new conditions. Linus will need to extract radioactive elements from the waste it produces, which in turn could be sold to nuclear plants overseas or other industries. Yet, even if Linus complies, it can only import and process rare earths in Malaysia until March 2026. Given the constant uncertainties, Linus has been forced to put a backup plan in place on its home ground. So this is where it gets a little bit more complicated. This is Australia, Manuel earlier, which I've shown you, Kuantan. So now a new plan is being set up in Kalgoorlie. Kalgoorlie in Western Australia, where Mount Weld is? Yes, it's near to Mount Weld. So this new plant in Kalgoorlie, you'll be able to process these substances there before it's sent to Kuantan plant. So there will be no more radioactive waste in Malaysia. So radioactive waste will be here in Kalgoorlie instead of Kuantan? That's right. OK, so think of the plan as cracking open a coconut. Get rid of the shell, that's radioactive waste. Kind of what will happen in Kalgoorlie. Scoop away the pulp, that's your rare earth. It goes to Kuantan. Next, chop, grate and grind. Pack it all and ship it off. With the risks in Malaysia, Kalgoorlie will be key for the future of Linus. But... What's going to happen to the radioactive waste? Great question. The sign says, Welcome to Kalgoorlie Boulder. Just beside it, I drive past the new Linus plant. It's seen as critical, providing an alternative to China's rare earth dominance. 30,000 people live in Kalgoorlie Boulder, and mining is what drives this town. Look at the size of this thing. Downtown Kalgoorlie is actually quite pretty. Heaps of historic buildings. Reading up on things to see here in Kalgoorlie, you'll be told to come here to check out the world's tallest bin. And here, a historical tour of Australia's oldest brothel. And here, one of the world's largest open pit mines full of gold. 
It's so deep, it can fit the world's second tallest building inside. Not far from the giant gold mine, I'm meeting a longtime resident who knows lots about rare earths. I want to find out why Linus picked this tiny place and why did Kalgoorlie agree? So we've been around for 130 years since gold was first discovered. Kalgoorlie actually used to be bigger than Perth as people flooded in for the gold rush. So one of the things by being linked to one major commodity is that the town basically cycles up and down with the gold price. And then as that rises, then town builds up, everyone comes in, but then when it drops off again, a lot of those workers will leave town. Right, of course. When it goes to a low period, the town suffers. Exactly right. But then around the 50s, nickel came on as well, and that diversified away from just gold. So really, the town wouldn't exist without mining. So very much with nickel as well. The price does spike and, and drop. So something the city's been really trying to push for is diversification and bring on other commodities that kind of even out some of those boom and bust cycles. Right, that's one way for Kalgoorlie to hedge its bets. So if we look at rare earths now, the demand doesn't have that kind of cyclic nature to it. So if you're thinking of smartphones and other technologies, we're only growing in demand and there's no obvious end in sight to that. All right, well, I understand why Kalgoorlie wanted Linus here, but why did Linus want Kalgoorlie? Great question. So there's uh, quite a few reasons around that. Kalgoorlie is a regional centre that's got a well-developed mining industry for services, skilled labour, all of those kind of things. So the other thing, there's, there's basically an access question. If we look at where their mine is, about four hours drive. So the other thing, there's a, a large rail line that runs across so from the processing plant in Kalgoorlie and then down to the Esperance port and over to Malaysia. So logistically, it works out really nicely. So Kwantan, Malaysia has seen heaps of protests over the years from people over Linus. Has there been the same thing here? Concerns, yes, but not the protests. As a mining town, we're a little bit more used to the risks associated with the industry, but generally the town has been very welcoming. And Karthik, we're talking about very low levels of radiation. What's going to happen to the radioactive waste? It will be stored temporarily on site and then go up for permanent disposal at their Mount World Mine into a permanent facility, purpose built to house this material, usually set underground or in a, an old disused mine pit, something along those lines uh, to keep it simplified. So what Kwantan rejected, Kalgoorlie has welcomed with open arms. It's been a hectic few weeks seeing firsthand the hidden fallouts of the global scramble for rare earth metals, crisscrossing Malaysia, then landing in Australian bushland. There is one place I couldn't get to, but I haven't forgotten. Our journalist in Myanmar, Nyang, managed to upload some photos and videos of some illegal mines in Kachin. He was meant to use a professional camera, but that turned out to be way too risky, so he's used his phone camera instead. I've been thinking about the best way to share it all. Let's do it the social media way. We've seen how the toxic pools in Myanmar look like from the satellite images. Well, take a look at this when you look at it close up. Notice the plastic sheets that line the pools. All that is holding them down is just cement bags. That's all. And that's all done to keep costs low. It's quite hazy in this image as well because it was raining quite heavily at the time. All right, now look at this picture, which is a bit clearer. I wonder, how is it going to hold up when they encounter strong monsoon winds in the mountains? Notice the pipes that are coming out of a hill. Going by the strange and chemical smell, Nyang said that it was definitely not water. Look at these pipes. It's like a spider web just placed on the slope of a mountain. Again, nothing really to hold them securely in place. And then there's this, one of the local Myanmar mine workers. He's wearing no protective gear. Most of the workers didn't want to be interviewed on camera, so Nyang did an audio interview instead. <laughs> Oh, 
，你这个居民也也要动起做，你说推推啦，推推。我恐怕，嗯，动起，也要动起，我也要动起。As for the locals who live around these areas, it's really disheartening to hear as well. It's been a confronting few weeks, and my feelings are mixed. Kinda like the many hues of rare earths. They come with a bright side for some, but a far somber one as well. On the next episode of the Power Scramble, I encounter gallium, also a critical metal. It's key to more powerful solar panels and faster charging electric cars. China again has a near stranglehold on supply, even though its neighbor to the south has plenty. All right, we're going to Vietnam. Vietnam has a treasure trove of gallium, yet why hasn't it made a dent on China's near monopoly? Well, time for my next adventure. <laughs> <laughs>